All right. My name is Ibon Wakabayashi, but my maiden name is Tasaka. I was born in Vancouver uh, at the Vancouver General Hospital and um, went to Japanese school. That's why I'm here. My name is Frank Hiroshi Kamiya. I was um, born in 1938 uh, at uh, Royal Columbian Hospital. My name is uh, Donald Kazuo Iwanaka. I was born in Cumberland in 1938. And we came to Vancouver in 1950-ish, I believe. OK, we uh, are in this picture. Uh, which was taken in May 1953. We all went to the Japanese school when uh, it opened up at, in 1953. And you'll see that I'm at the far end here, Don is here, and you'll see Yvonne over in this area here, that beautiful girl over there. And we... Uh, we went to school, and I guess we met a lot of um, Japanese Canadians at that time. My father was a, uh, from a large family, 17 surviving children, and they lived on uh, Salt Spring Island. And uh, I have a picture of my grandfather, and that's my father. I believe he might have been about five years old. But he was sent to Japan with an older sister to learn Japanese. And uh, so he uh, had his education in Japan. And then he came back to Canada with his wife, my mother. And uh, they were involved with uh, the Kitsilano Japanese Language School. So there's a connection here. Well, we went to several places. I think we were at uh, three different places. And uh, I think the first place we went to was around Chase, BC, which is just outside of Kamloops, and then we went to um, Seymour Arm in a very remote logging camp where my father and his brothers worked for this, for uh, logging and um, um, tile work for the sawmill. And that was where we continued on to um, another area, Blind Bay and Notch Hill, mainly because my parents were educators, that, you know, school was very important. We only spoke Japanese at home because of my parents being from Japan. So we needed to learn English. So that's why we made the move uh, to a school, one room school, grades one to seven. No ESL, <laughs> but it was good memories. Good memories, yeah. Yes, as I said, I was born in 1938. Uh, and um, we lived in Pitt Meadows, uh, where um, um, my uh, father's uh, sister had a farm in that same area. And we, in 42, we, uh, we moved to uh, Manitoba to, on, on the Sugar Beach Farms. And the place that we were at was called Oak Bluff. And um, there were quite a few Japanese families that went uh, to uh, Manitoba as well. Uh, when we first got there, um, there weren't any accommodations, so my dad being a carpenter, one of the reasons he went to Manitoba was he was asked to build a lot of these internment, uh, uh, I don't know if you would call them shacks, but they were accommodation for families. And quite often they were families of uh, two or three that would, were in there. In fact, in our building, uh, there were four bedrooms, uh, one was used by my, uh, my father and, and uh, mother, and then I was in that same bedroom as well, sleeping between the, the parents. And the other one uh, was another couple, and they had um, uh, my other brother that was there. He was about two and a half, and um, he was sleeping in that room. And then there was a third one, another one person or two people in there. The fourth bedroom was used for um, for storage of all our our possessions, I guess, which wasn't very much at the beginning. But some of the things that they had, they had to leave outside under a tarp uh, to protect it from the cold winters and that. 
And um, from there we stayed till um, about 1948, moved around to some other places as well. We ended up going to Fort Gary. Uh, my dad being a carpenter, he had quite a bit of work in carpentry uh, because he was, uh, him and his friends were fairly good at their job. They had uh, all kinds of work uh, during the, uh, area, uh, the times that we didn't have to work on the sugar beets. When we got there to Manitoba and Oak Bluff, we, uh, the children didn't speak any English. But you know how children are very adaptable, so we ended up talking to our neighbors who were Haujing or um, Caucasian, and they would, um, uh, we would play with them and con you know communicate that way. And, and after a while, you, you, you sort of got to uh, understand what they're saying and vice versa. And my name was Hiroshi at that time and our Caucasian friends didn't, weren't able to say that that easily. So their father said, well, we're, we're going to call you Frank. Out of the blue, you, you just picked a name and my, that name stuck. Until now, where legally you have to have everything the way your uh, birth certificate states, right? Uh, our, my brother was uh, Archie. Uh, it was called Archie, but his uh, Japanese name was Atsushi. So it was sort of close to Archie and, and Atsushi. Shisui. So that's uh, how that uh, came about. My father came to Canada, I believe he's probably late teen. He came with his brother and my grandfather. And my grandfather eventually went back to Japan before the war. And my uncle and my dad stayed here. My mother was born in Vancouver on Raymer Avenue. Uh, they, had, they had a large family. And uh, she went to school here. And my early life, as I remember, we lived, they were together and we lived on Vancouver Island, like Duncan, Cumberland. I mean, every small town, I think we lived in it for a while. And then when the war broke out, we uh, came to Vancouver and then we went to Tashmi. And we stayed there for a few years. And then my dad got an uh, offer of uh, working in the sawmill again <clears throat> in Brookmere. So uh, we left Tashmi and went to Brookmere during the war. And then after that, my father landed up in the hospital in Princeton. So we moved to Princeton where we stayed till the war ended. And we immigrated to, uh, or moved to Vancouver. And that was, I think, yeah, I remember when I went to Vancouver, I was in grade six, and I, I spent two weeks, or no, two months at General Gordon. And then my father kept on buying different businesses. He had uh, a cleaners when he first came, he had a confectionery, then they had a general store, and then my father finally went to, uh, when he was close to old, he was, uh, worked in gardening. So. That's all I can remember. But we spoke English. I remember speaking English. Because um, your mother was Canadian, right? Yeah. Well, did she went to Japanese school too. I'm not, I can't remember the detail, but she did go to Japanese school in Vancouver. And my father also spoke English. Uh, so yeah, so that my education was pretty much uh, English. I learned when I came to Vancouver and I went to Japanese school here. Yeah, I, my early life is, uh, is funny. I, uh, looking back, I don't remember being any f much different from the, my Caucasian friends. Because when we lived in Princeton during the war, all my friends were Caucasian, but there was, very, there was only one of the Japanese family there at that time. And uh, so if I wanted to play, it was Caucasians. And I don't remember ever being uh, looked down upon as being the enemy. You know, like we got along fine. In fact, when the war was over, I thought we beat the enemy. Uh, and I was quite young then, so but that's what, I remember that. She tried to make Japanese food, though we, we 
all the so-called ingredients that we just couldn't get it. So she tried, you know, I guess we could much as show you stuff like that, but uh, that's about it. To be honest, I don't really remember eating all that much. And it was, I would say, probably, I think shoyu is probably about the only thing that we had that was Japanese, Oriental type of thing. With the family, uh, it was always Japanese because my mother didn't speak anything, uh, any English at all. My father, having gone out to get work on that, he was able to speak a little bit of uh, English, but at home it's always, uh, um, yeah, always Jap uh, Japanese. I, I don't recall too much uh, in those days, but uh, I remember one incident where um, my father uh, went hunting and uh, picked up some rabbit, and my mother made that, and first they said, oh, it's, it's like chicken, you better try it out. <laughs> and after we heard that it was rabbit, we didn't want to eat it, but uh, you know, in those days, uh, you know, we didn't have a lot of food, although, um, you know, you can buy things. And, and I'm sure we had, or the parents had some issues for buying a lot of meat and that, so they, they tried that. But we, we normally ate, you know, Japanese type of foods because they were from Japan. I don't remember what kind, you know, as children were adaptable, uh, we, we always had rice. Partly because my dad had um, befriended the, the grocery store in, in Winnipeg and he did some renovation work for them. So he was always able to get more than enough rice. So that was always good. And I'm sure in the summertime they would have a little plot of land that they would make some vegetables as well. And I, I still like my Japanese foods. Yeah, the other day we just had some fuki with salmon and. It sort of brings back the memories of you know, what we used to eat. I know my children don't like that too much, but uh, some of us enjoy that. Yes, I, I have a similar story about rabbits because that's what we ate and it did taste like chicken. <laughs> and uh, the other thing that, I have a picture, but I won't go through that. I, my mom was a dressmaker and a teacher, and uh, that's what she did, clothe us, you know, during the war years. It was cold where we lived, uh, like Vancouver, and uh, my dad didn't have need for suits anymore, so she made uh, the recycled and redesigned clothing for my brothers and I to make us look respectable, sending us off to school. And uh, I appreciate that more and more now when I think about it. And. Uh, the one picture I have, I'm wearing a rabbit fur around here, a white one. And if my grandchildren saw that, I would be in great trouble. But I have to say, it was for warmth and it was for embellishment. My mom was very creative in that way. But uh, so coming back to food, uh, yes, we eat rice most of the time. And uh, I married, you know, a Japanese. Uh, Nisei, so I think he married me for my mother's cooking. Mm -hmm. That is the rumor. And I accept it because, uh, you know, there are other things to do when you're a student studying. Uh, but I actually brought this. I copied it from my computer. I found it in my mother's um, little chair that she used always for her dressmaking. And it's a list of all the Japanese foods that she made on New Year's Day. And I, I think, my gosh, you know, she worked six days a week and made deliveries, dry cleaning after that and had people living at the house, you know, relatives that were going to school in Vancouver that we housed. This is behind her dressmaking store. And I think about her all the time, the sacrifices they made, but they were both, you know, um, Japanese speaking. So this is what we spoke at home. And 49, when I came back, to Vancouver, my brother and I were the only Japanese at General Gordon School where Don also had attended. But we were just accepted, no discrimination. And the girl that I met there in grade six on the steps of the school, Kathy McLean is her name, we just had our reunion on Friday. 
And there were three of us from General Gordon. We've known each other for 70 something years, but my friends at the time were mostly Caucasian. And without them, I wouldn't have learned about roast beef and mashed potatoes and that, because our menu was always like this, not quite as fancy, this is New Year's. Well, it, there's quite a bit. I don't know how she did it, but she just managed to make New Year's very special for us. Uh, and uh, the relatives, I mean, the 17 siblings that my father had. Well, she's got Kazunoko, that's very special. She must have had a fisherman friend. And then Sunomono, uh, which of course we all make now. Kimpira, with a burdock. Nishime, which is like um, a pot uh, stew with all kinds of special things like kamaboko and so on. And takenoko. Sashimi, of course. Daikon, to go with it. Taco, that's octopus. Ika and uh, yaki niku and teriyaki and chicken wings. I don't know, she must have fed a lot of people. A roast, she even made roast. Sushi and kanten, a dessert. Manju and mame and a sekihan, the pink rice. And you know, not to go too far, but I do a, a real shortcut of New Year's. I still feel it's important for my grandchildren and even my sons-in-law, they, they enjoy sushi. And you know how it is now. Sushi is very much the place they go you know, for their nights out. Um, but anyway, I take shortcuts because there's Fujiya. <laughs> you can pick up a lot of these things there. But you know, in those days, they had to make the oboro, the pink part of the maki sushi. I mean, they had to make it from scratch. And I think uh, I remember with um, sushi and everything. You know, we can buy it now, but she made it from scratch. Manju with the bean paste in the middle. Our stove was always cooking with, you know, the uncle, and it was a mess, you know. But anyway, that's what she did. Osekihan was the pink rice that, you know, with the sticky rice, with the beans, and it's for good luck. So they had a meaning for each of these, and she wanted to pass that kind of information to us. And so I try, not in the way she did it, you know, you know like a lot of um, ordered foods, but uh, I do try to make some of it uh, for my grandchildren and my, my children now. So food is so very important. Yeah, for, for, for us, when we were in Winnipeg, uh, there wasn't really a community there. We are all in small uh, farming areas, so we didn't have anything like that. So e even for New Year's and that, we, I'm sure uh, the parents tried to do something for that because that's a special special day for them. But other than that, we didn't have any obon or anything like that. There's no church close by either, so. Well, yeah, we were with all Caucasians, so, you know, we pretty well lived a Caucasian type of lifestyle, try to fit right in. And I think we did fit in because it, I don't remember I very few occasions where I felt like I was discriminated, but most of the time uh, our Eng we all spoke English, so we were accepted, and uh, except a few times you could feel a little bit of animosity, but nothing was that much. When, and I was very young, so I, you know, it didn't really affect me all that much. But as far as Japanese food, I don't think until we came to Vancouver, we didn't even really get a chance to eat Japanese food. In, small town like Princeton, you don't get any ingredients whatsoever. All we had is a red and white store, and that was basically about it. It was like a general store, yeah, like Safeway type of thing, but it's a lot smaller in those days. But so, yeah, I, I, and all my friends were all Caucasians. Uh, I felt like I was a Caucasian. I didn't realize I was Japanese. What was your name again, so, the, your, your official name? Kazuo. Well, Kazuo. My Japanese name, Kazuo, yeah. And so did your parents name you Don, or...? Oh, yeah. yeah Donald Kazuo Iwanaka, yeah. That's and then Frank, you correct. were Hiroshi. I was given that name Frank, yes. Yeah. Well, myself, it was like school life like anybody else. I, I didn't feel like there was no... Well, there was, I were the only Japanese in town, so there was... 
I don't remember any discrimination whatsoever. The kids, we all got along well. Uh, as I say, sometimes there was some with some of the parents, but it wasn't anything that it really bothered me. So we kind of like assimilated right through. So until I came to Vancouver, then things changed. I don't remember a lot about uh, school in those days, except that being in the country, we had to walk a long ways uh, to school. You know, whether it's in snow or uh, not, not much rain there, but the cold, it uh, took us a while to get there. I have to follow what Frank says. It was a long ways to school, and it was cold. And um, my brother told me he was in grade four, and he was the school he was the school janitor. And we had to walk three and a half miles from where we lived along the railway tracks because the snow wasn't as heavy there early in the morning. And, and then he would turn on, uh, you know, turn up the, um, the furnace at school before the rest of the class came. This was in Notch Hill, one of our places that we lived. And it was a one-room school, grades one to seven, one teacher. Can you imagine preparing for that many children? We uh, didn't have anything like library books or any of that en enrichment that, you know, the kids now have. But you know what? We didn't know any different. We were, you know, I was three and a half when we left Vancouver. And uh, I guess uh, I was um, grade six when I came back to Vancouver. But that period uh, in the interior, it was an unofficial um, self-supporting area, not like Tashmi and others. Uh, that was. I shouldn't say that, I don't know all the history. But uh, so it, we had um, uh, a few Japanese families, two other families that I remember. And uh, so we did speak a little bit of Japanese because of our parents. Uh, but my parents tried awfully hard to, you know, have us um, get involved in things. You know, she, they sent me on the Greyhound bus to Salmon Arm, 22 miles away. And I met others there, like the Ogawas and the Iwatas, and they um, sort of taught me a lot of things about city life and uh, the things they had. Comic books? Oh, my goodness. Tom Mex comic books and Hopalong Cassidy. We had never seen anything like that. And I asked the Iwata boys, can I take one home for my brothers? I mean, it was like that, you know. But I, I can't say that it was difficult for the children. The parents sacrificed so much to make it pretty normal for us. And uh, so I think, though, I always sort of felt that I never really got that English language down right <laughs> because of the way, you know, we started in school. And it wasn't until we came back to Vancouver that we really uh, were integrated with the Caucasian uh, families. And I'm grateful for that. And we still have these wonderful lifelong friends that we get together with, yeah. Well, we spent a lot of time um, it, with, with nature, you know, and, and uh, my brothers and I, we, we didn't have the things like toys, you know, which was almost a good thing. And, uh, you know, I have pictures of my brothers and I chasing grasshoppers and, you know, in the meadows uh, where we lived. And, uh, I mean, there were things like the bear that came into our, you know, and my uncle had to shoot it. And so we had uh, bear meat for a while. I mean, it was, it was almost like a, you know, something you make up, but it was that way. And I, one more thing I'll say is to do with schooling. My brother was uh, six uh, when we lived in uh, the remote area of Seymour Arm, and uh, there was no school. But my aunt who lived with us was, uh, had a grade 12 education, and she managed to get um, uh, correspondence from Victoria, I guess, and she taught my brother grade one through correspondence. And that's quite something, you know. Then it, I think I wasn't as smart as my brother, <laughs> and so my parents decided, got to get the you know, family to Blind Bay where there was a one-room school. But, you know, there was always um, happy memories because Mrs. MacArthur picked us up in the morning because it was a long ways to school on the other side of the lake. And um, she, they were so kind. There was no discrimination. And I did meet some more 
uh, friends, um, Caucasian friends, and so I picked up a bit more about you know socializing and so on. And then from there to Notch Hill, where I met more Japanese families. But um, my grade, my brother in grade, you know, grade four being a janitor, I, I said, did you get paid? And <laughs> I don't think so. It wasn't turning a switch. It was kindling and all that. But you know, it's really, to me, we didn't really, um, we benefited from that experience. Because I think, like I find with all my, my Nisei friends, they're a real different breed. You know, they've had to go through different hardships along with their parents, and they're really strong. I mean, look at, at his age and Don's age too. They're, you know, very much involved with the community here and plant sales and, you know, and, and all of these. So I really think that because of the internment, there's been a lot of positives. And there, there are not too many negatives that I remember because of our age. I mean, definitely older people, when they were interrupted with their schooling and so on, you know, it was a different story. But three and a half, I mean, you know, what do I remember of before the war? And uh, so the, during the war was just fun uh, with fishing and, you know, chasing rabbits. And, you know, it was an experience that I wish my grandchildren had now. You know, it's the iPhone and, well, they're involved in a lot of sports and so. This is what we try to pass on to that next generation. Well, to be honest, I never realized I wasn't happy. Like life, I, we were living the same as all my Caucasian friends and we fit in and what they had, we had. And so I didn't feel like I was deprived. I didn't realize till later how much we were deprived that we could have had this. Like at Christmas time, we were allowed one present birthday one present that was it i remember the whole thing but i don't think my caucasian friends were any better off than we were in fact one of my caucasian friends i remember he had a pair of jeans and this friend of mine he grew like a weed and his mother kept on putting patches onto his pants every year every he grew like a weed and he kept on growing and his mother kept on adding on so I remember things like that. So, I mean, looking back, I didn't feel that I was deprived, you know. And I actually, my, for myself, I thought our childhood is no better or no worse than anybody else. You know, we, uh, the same, same way with my family as well. Uh, we're so isolated that uh, we fit in with the, the family next door and um, the, the Caucasian friends. We had a great time in the summertime. Uh, they had a pony and uh, they had built a little cart. So we were riding on that just about every day. Uh, in the winter time, they would have a little, they would convert into a sled. And uh, we had some great times there. For other things, you make up your own, own games. You know, we didn't have baseball or gloves or anything like that. So we made up a, a game that I don't even know what it's called, but you actually make it with a piece of, piece of a long stick. You flip it up and try and hit it and, and play it like baseball. So we did that and the regular um, kick the can and stuff around, like that around the barn or whatever it was. Those things, we, we did that all the time whenever we ha got together with other, other kids. I can't really say that I had anything that I remember that was sad. Oh yeah, our dog, <laughs> yeah. We had a pet, yeah. And uh, you know, in the winter he chased cars and you know, unfortunately that was sad. We, we, we did things, like you, you know, like Frank says, we made up things to keep us busy. And um, we had uh, Mr. Miyashita who lived in Alberta, and I don't know the proper word, but you know, he worked with, is it called a chicken uh, sexer? Chicken sexing, yeah. Yeah, sexing. And he sent us 50 male chicks, and our job was to keep them alive in the cold winter. And then my brothers and I, we would have a little funeral uh, for each one that died <laughs> and put a stick there. I mean, we did things like that, like E V E V I over, was it? Yeah, and, yeah. And, uh, and you know, it it really uh, was an atmosphere of creativity. Yes. 
And I, I'm really grateful for that, you know. But they didn't have, we didn't have toys. We made our toys, you know. And so this is what I say. I don't feel like a survivor. I really feel that we had that wonderful experience. Definitely our parents were the survivors and, uh, and they sacrificed so much. And that's why, you know, I just always think of the tribute for their sacrifices. My, my, uh, I remember uh, Santa Claus, he's a Japanese Santa Claus, <laughs> my dad. <laughs> So he tried his hardest, but uh, I don't remember the gifts we got, but that's the way it was in, in the remote areas. Yeah, but for us children, uh, and because Frank is very much involved with plants, I love plants, but you know, I'm not one for so much the exotic, you know, orchids and things. I like these um, wildflowers and ferns and uh, weeds and, uh, um, you know, forget-me-nots and so on. Okay, I'll stop. The only sad memory I have is, I guess I was maybe about 10, 11 years old, and this one kid, he was 18, and uh, he used to play baseball with us, scrub baseball and this kind of stuff. And I remember he wanted to buy a car, so his father told him that if you want a car, you've got to go out and work. So he went out and work in the forest, and he got killed when a tree came down. And I can remember his father saying, oh, I wish if he was alive to buy him a brand new car. And that, that to me was one of my saddest memories. And I, I remember for quite a while because nobody I knew passed away before that. And I was at least 10, 11 years old. I don't recall anything that was sad, obviously, if somebody passed away, but I don't have any real sad memories. Um, I think when we came back to Vancouver, we had to help the family um, with earning some money. You know? And so I think similarly, um, we had jobs in the summer where we went to Abbotsford or Aldergrove to pick berries all summer and that was a good experience. We learned independence, cooking and uh, you know and meeting friends. We met friends, Japanese friends that were there, there also picking berries. How old were you at this time? You, um, were, you came back in 1949 uh, and uh, Frank can you help me with that? Well we went uh, berry picking in Mount Lehman. Uh, you were next door at Okabe's right? No. That was, is it? Ukawa's. Stan oh, Stan. Yeah. Well, we, we were at Katsumoto's and the next door was Okabe's where a lot of the Hayashi girls were. So you're about that was. Then, right? Pardon? A little older. No, no, probably 13 to 12, 15. 13, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And it wasn't like work that we weren't forced to go there, but we felt our duty to help out the family if we can mm -hmm. and get out of their way in the way too in the summertime. And it was phony for two, three weeks, so it wasn't too bad. I went for the whole summer. Really, for the oh. we earned a lot more money than you. Well, you <laughs> oh, must have. You couldn't have picked all strawberries. Well, then we oh, lost well, it that no, long. strawberries and raspberries, and yeah. we got moved around to other places that oh, need. Uh, okay, yeah. 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 But then, you know, it helped us to earn money to go to the PME and buy clothes sure, for school. Right. Yeah. So I'm grateful for that, and yeah. and the friendships we made there. I, I met a lot of the Japanese friends there. Um, and also, I worked at the fish cannery in West Vancouver, where I met more Japanese friends. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we had good experiences, you know. I can fill it a fish. <laughs> My husband can't. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, and then I did get a job, you know, in an office, uh, typing and that kind of thing. But it was always sort of to help to um, help the family with finances. Going back, I remember Frank and I were at the same farm picking berries, and it was the first time where I spent any time with the, any Japanese period. And I tell you, we, we had a lot of fun. We'd gone to little, no, I shouldn't say trouble, we'd do this, one of our friends there, he was always doing something to create problems. Like the farmer said, okay, guys, get up, get up. And this friend would say, yeah, 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 okay, we'll be up, we'll be up, we're getting up now. And after the farmer left, he said, I go back to sleep. 
and be back again another 15 minutes we go through all that. You remember that? Yeah, right. yeah. But we had actually, to be honest, looking back, I had, I had a good time. I mean, we worked hard, don't get me wrong. It was hard work, but we still, and, and we had friends for life type of thing, you know, at Frank and, yeah. The best thing about that for me was <clears throat> there's all kinds of social function being put on by the Japanese community to get us together. Like there was dances, but every other week there's a dance somewhere. And uh, we'd always go and everybody, all the guys would be saying, well, I wonder what new girls are coming into town this week. <laughs> and that was one of the things that we all talked about. We were all, all guys and, wow, a Japanese girl? Like, when I was a kid, I didn't know there was such a thing as Japanese. I never saw them. So once we got to Vancouver, holy cow, you know, it was like, <laughs> you can laugh, but it was really, that's what it was like. I don't know if Frank can remember that. Yeah, in, in those days, um, uh, the Japanese language school was sort of the community hall in a way. And in fact, that's where we met uh, Yvonne and she was the one that sort of tried to teach me how to dance. <laughs> but um, there were actually fun times, I thought. Yeah, and um, Japanese, lang Japanese language school was very, actually very good to, to me as well. We lived only uh, about a block away or half a block away from the school at that time. And, uh, you know, we talked earlier about how many days we uh, went to school. Uh, I don't remember whether it's two, two or three days, but it must have been two or three days a week. Uh, we, we didn't think we learned a lot, but I was really grateful that I was able to write Japanese in hiragana. You learned some kanji, which is the characters, but you know, unless you use it, you forget it all. But when I went to school in Toronto, I um, couldn't afford to make a phone call home. So I used to write to my mother two or three times a year. And uh, all in hiragana, exactly the way I speak. So the grammar was terrible probably, but she was able to understand what I was saying. And uh, that was actually quite a, a nice thing that I was able to do uh, to connect with my family back home. Japanese school, yes, that's where I met a lot of my friends. And uh, I didn't teach you how to dance, did I? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember no, that. I, I mean, never learned. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, there were a lot of social functions, and I think uh, it was very much uh, Japanese and, and the Chinese community, mm -hmm, too. Yeah. And that's how we really met a lot of people, learned to dance. <laughs> and, uh, uh, yes, and... and um, I remember at the uh, kids, the um, uh, Vancouver Japanese Language School, uh, the teachers, Mr. and Mrs. Sato, and they worked very hard to try to teach us. And uh, I, I think um, the reason I, I probably was sent there was because my parents were friends of the Satos, and uh, I had a. It was a bit difficult because they expected so much of me. <laughs> A daughter of a school teacher, and I—I I was not a serious, t you know, student. It was a social function for me to go to, and uh, like I say, though, the good that came out of that, though, like Frank, I—I um, I did learn to, you know, write uh, hiragana, katakana, and uh, I was able to. I am still able to write, you know, in a romaji more to my uncle. The only remaining sibling on my fa father's side in Japan, and he's 96, and he writes me back. So it's more Romaji, you know. For, my, uh, for myself, I feel that, uh, you know, even though we're Japanese, we fit it in very well, like uh, in society overall, and I, that's one of the things that I, I, I mean, it wasn't that we purposely did it, but we just kind of worked around, and we fit it in. and, and even to this day, there's not a lot of Japanese around, so people other than Japanese, 
they don't run into us a lot to have any kind of a discord or confrontation or things. So I don't know. I think uh, other than when I was working, I had problems in that regard. But it was uh, very subtle. You didn't know that. So I, I, I don't know. I can't say as I'm overall, I think everything went as, as about as good as it could have gone for me. Yeah, you know, we, um, uh, I'm actually glad that we've got so many close Japanese Canadian friends. We still meet with them, you know, you know locally in the uh, center like this, uh, and even um, casually as well. M most of them are Japanese Canadians. Uh, I do meet with my Hagujing friends every now and then too. I have lunch with one just about every week, but uh, generally it's uh, with events that we may have here uh, or el elsewhere in the city, um, and uh, we're going to have another get-together this coming Saturday at a picnic, so things like that. Uh, it's a nice connection to be with, uh, be in this Japanese Canadian community, I think. I live in uh, the Brentwood area, and it's almost become a sort of a Jap Japan town. Mm -hmm. And it's really been nice for me because friends that I made at the uh, cannery where I work and the berry picking days and, you know, places that uh, I spent a lot of my youth, they've sort of congregated in our area. And, and so we have a, a weekly coffee time. My husband has his weekly coffee time. Uh, but we were very inclusive. You know, we invite others if uh, they would be interested. Um, I have spent a lot of time with uh, Caucasian friends and colleagues because I think because I lived in Quetzalano, and it seemed to me after the war, it was uh, a lot more integrated. I, I may be wrong, but um, yeah, it's um, nice to be here at Nikkei Place. Tonari Gumi, and you know we we have a certain dealings with the uh, Japanese community still. I'm not sure if I encourage them, uh, but my son has really taken. He, he got involved a lot in the Japanese community, Tonari Gumi, and the Buddhist church and this type of thing, and uh, which I'm I'm glad he did. Uh, you know, but no, we didn't encourage them to do it, but they did it on their own. So I'm quite happy about that. Yeah, I try to encourage my kids to participate, and some of them have volunteered here. Um, and um, they, they, with their sports, they, they're always connected with their Hagujin friends for that. Um, so I, we try to have the traditional meals and that, you know, New Year's and that, all birthdays and that. He, quite often with Japanese food there, too. Yeah. Uh, I can't say that I've really encouraged them very much. Although when the grandparents were still with us, we uh, did speak uh, within the family, and they p probably picked up some of the words, voc vocabulary. Uh, but, uh, you know, they um, live in a, an area where it's um, very international, and the food, uh, you know, it's everything from Vietnamese to Chinese to Korean. I mean, it, they're all biracial couples in their neighborhood, and it's been fun, you know, uh, trying the different foods from different countries. Uh, but uh, Japanese is what I do on New Year's Day, try to bring that into. And my, my children don't want any of my Japanese things. <laughs> they have their own style, and I don't make it a, you know, I'm hoping the grandchildren might take an interest, uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's the way it is. It's very inclusive and international, and food is the way it is. The language is the way it is. So, yeah. Yes, I've been to Japan quite a few times. Well, what happened is uh, when my uh, father and my uncle they would inherit Japanese property there, and uh, rather than keeping it for themselves since they left Japan early 
and they felt they weren't entitled to it, so they signed it over to my aunt, and now it's gone to my cousin. Anyway, he's told us that any time any the evil Nakas go to Japan, they can stay as long as they want for free. So I have taken advantage of that, and my son has. Yeah, uh, my first trip to Japan was 1970 when I was working for Arthur Erickson. He did the um, Japan Pavilion. So uh, with my parents, we went there. And since then, I've gone there, I don't know, maybe eight or ten times. Uh, we did the, um, our firm did the um, Japan Pavilion in 1986. So I got to go there a few times there at that time. And I really enjoy Japan and especially the food there, and their culture as well. Um, I, I embrace, uh, in, in, you know, with architecture as well, so, and uh, their uh, pottery and things like that, I quite enjoy. Yes, it reminds me, yes, that uh, I guess we've had uh, a lot of associations with Japan, um, my husband mostly, and uh, there's been, like in Vancouver or British Columbia, a lot of joint ventures with Japan. So the language became important. And uh, families came, uh, you know, working on the, these projects. And I, I did have to use my Japanese to help them, you know, adjust to the culture, doctor's appointments, enrolling them in school, that kind of thing. So it, it has come in handy. And I don't realize it until I think about it a little bit more. Uh, and they, in turn, taught me things, you know, uh, that uh, I, I guess I've tried to learn. Um, yes, I have been to Japan a number of times because of, of uh, work. And uh, myself, um, I did go there for an extended time because of the work I was doing, which is very much uh, inspired by Japan and Japan design and so forth, yeah. So it's all come together. <laughs>